This is part three of three, brutalizing Maddie Powlett's hate rant against the LGBTQ community. Parts one and two are linked in the description below, and you should probably watch them both before seeing this one. Okay, deep breath. <sighs> We're almost done. Roll title card. Then on we go. Flame 16. Convicted pedophiles. Meaning child molesters. Have been reading books to children at library events. Look at this. All gays wanted to be able to do was to get married, they said. But within a few short years after the Supreme Court made it legal nationwide in 2015, we saw the proliferation of dozens of different genders, right? Preteen child drag queens and drag queen story hour events popping up at libraries across the country. In numerous cases, the drag queens who were reading books to children at the events have been found to be convicted pedophiles. What a surprise, he says. What a surprise. I investigated this claim for many, many hours. All I could find were a recent high-profile arrest and three incidents at a Houston library, years ago, during the Drag Queen Story Hour events there. Two of the latter are highly suspect. Here's what I found. The first Houston incident, which is confirmed. Albert Alfonso Garza, a convicted child molester who served time in prison, volunteered at Houston Public Library on three occasions, once in 2017 and twice in 2018. He used a different name on his paperwork and didn't provide a social security number or birth date for himself. Library staff did not follow policy and do a background check as they were supposed to. The Houston Public Library Executive Director, Dr. Rhea Brown Lawson, noted that people with criminal backgrounds are not allowed to read to children there, and that this error will not be repeated. Even before this incident, all of the Drag Queen Story Hour events were supervised by library staff, and all of the children present were supervised by parents or guardians. Houston police also reported that Garza, who has already served his sentence and is registered properly, has no restrictions on whom he can be around. It is legal for him to be near children. The second Houston incident, which is very suspect. Incident 2 concerns someone named William Travis Dees. Allegedly, Dees was convicted in 2004 of four counts of child sexual assault. The group that supposedly discovered this, Mass Resistance, is a hate group that has a hard-on for hating LGBTQ people. Its Texas chapter leader, Tracy Shannon, went on a crusade against the Drag Queen Story Hour events. This group, quote, "...identified numerous aliases which Dees uses for his various characters and personas," end quote. They claim that since he was 16 at the time of his conviction, his criminal record was sealed, Yet, they were able to obtain it from other, quote, sex offender record sources, end quote. I assume they got it from something like this super reputable website, arrestfacts.com, which is currently the only place I can find a record for William Travis Dees three years later. Let's give this story the benefit of the doubt for now. Mass Resistance says they somehow determined that Dees has multiple aliases, and now has a transgender alter ego, their words, named Lisa Lott. Their only proof that I can find is this possibly edited photo. I can't find any other copies of it except on two anti-pedophile articles. But wait! Mass Resistance bolsters its case with this mighty evidence. They identify Dees, slash Lott, as the author of an article written by a transgender dominatrix. Well... The article is written by an anonymous author, actually, and their name was changed to Elizabeth Davidson. But it has this picture that kind of looks like the person previously shown, so maybe they're the same person? Although we don't actually know if this is the author of the article or not. Either way, the article was pretty well thought out and insightful. So let's give Mass Resistance a huge bucket full of credibility further. Let's assume... All that they've claimed is true. What happened? 
Dee's supposedly served as a greeter for drag queen story hour events. That's literally it. Are you serious? Dee's is also sometimes called a drag queen story hour reader, but I am not sure if that is the case, as information seems contradictory. On top of all of this, an article written by the two directors of the reading events, Trent, Lyra, and Devin Wool, reiterated that in October of 2018, quote, we gave the HPL, Houston Public Library, legal department, a comprehensive list of every guest performer, every book read, and every song sung. From that point forward, if any performers wanted to be involved in our story time, or if previous performers wanted to read in the future, they needed to apply as volunteers and undergo background checks, an existing library policy that, until then, had not been enforced in this case, an oversight for which the library has apologized." End quote. Then, on March 15th, 2019, came the news that Albert Alfonso Garza, who I mentioned before, was a registered sex offender. In the time between October 2018 and March 2019, when Lyra and Will permanently canceled the events, they reported that, quote, everyone who has performed since October, including ourselves, has undergone a background check and has clean records, end quote. I found an Outsmart article written on January 1st, 2019. It references events on October 27th, when Sister Jeff, who Mass Resistance claims is Deez's drag name, greeted participants in the Drag Queen Story Hour. The article, written by the event organizers Lyra and Will, also features a picture under its headline, showing them posing with Lisa Lott, mentioning her by name. So it seems she was a reader at the Storytime events. But that means she went through a background check and passed. So where does the record that Mass Resistance provided come from? Quite frankly, I think it's fake. This is for two reasons. First, because they're a hate group with an agenda. Second, because according to the Texas Family Code section 58.253, juvenile records can be sealed automatically if they meet certain criteria. I looked up William Dees in the Texas Sex Offender Registry, and it looks like the record was indeed sealed if it is even real, as the only record is for a 70-year-old man. Mass Resistance claims that because Dees was 16, his record doesn't show up on government databases, but does show up on other public sources. Interestingly enough, this flies in the face of the professional experience of a law firm from Texas. Hoshler Gebia Cepeda, PLLC, are a criminal defense firm in San Antonio, Texas. Their website has this to say about sealed records for juveniles in Texas. Quote, As opposed to restricted records... Sealed records are not accessible even by federal offices. If your record is sealed, even federal criminal justice agencies are not able to access them. Those records will officially not exist. There are instances where sealing juvenile records is not possible. These include The person is a registered sex offender When a determinate sentence is issued for a case such as murder, sexual assault, or indecency with a minor If the case took place in an adult court if the person qualifies as a habitual felony offender. Records can still be sealed for felony adjudications. The individual in question must be at least 19 years old, not have any additional convictions, and not certified as an adult. In addition, their records must not have been used as evidence in any criminal proceedings punishment phase. End quote. So it looks like Lisa Lott is indeed a drag performer who read to children at the Houston Library Drag Queen Storytime events. And she's likely being slandered by a far-reaching anti-LGBTQ hate group who's trying to capitalize on one legitimate story they broke of an unrelated registered sex offender. Because, no matter what their past is, William Travis Dees isn't listed as a sex offender by the Texas government. The evidence mass resistance provides is super sketchy. In the end, it seems the drag performer Lisa Lott was either not officially affiliated with the events and only served as a greeter, or, as is likely the case, she was a reader at the events and passed a background check in the wake of the confirmed allegation about Albert Alvonso Garza. I researched this story for literally hours. All of the evidence I could find appears to stem from this one mass resistance web article. Because of all this, 
the lack of decent evidence to support their claim, as well as the fact that not a single reputable news organization anywhere even references the story, I consider these allegations against Lisa Lott to likely be complete libel. If they were true, it shouldn't have been this hard to prove them. The third supposed Houston-based event. This one was once again exposed by the same hate group, Mass Resistance. They claim that the drag performer Miss Kitty Litter ATX, legal name David Richardson, was arrested for prostitution in 1996. Miss Kitty is a reader who has attended drag queen storytime events in Texas, according to the group. The problem is that, once again, a single page on the Mass Resistance website seems to be the only source for the supposed proof that David Lee Richardson has a criminal record. They provide a record for David Lee Richardson, who indeed has one charge of prostitution from 1996. But if this is the same person, which it may well be, that is a Class B misdemeanor for which they were fined $500 and it looks like they served probation instead of jail time. And in my opinion, prostitution should be legal anyway. I also looked up David Richardson in the Texas Sex Offender Registry. Once again, I could not find the person mass resistance refers to. So, no. Whatever this drag performer's record is, he's not a registered sex offender in Texas, despite multiple sketchy articles explicitly referring to him as such. Shane Trejo, the author of one of the articles, also claims that David Richardson is, quote, another sexual predator who has been found grooming children, end quote. Not only is this factually incorrect, but Trejo is also such a dumbass that he misidentifies Richardson repeatedly as David Robinson. All three times he slash Miss Kitty Litter is mentioned throughout the article and repeatedly refers to him as a sex offender, despite that being a lie. You are failing! Shane Trejo also refers to internal documents that supposedly mention Robert... Sorry, Richardson wasn't sure he would be allowed to attend the story events given his prostitution conviction, but these aren't provided by Trejo anywhere I can find. It's safe to say that this is, at the least, an embellished fear-mongering tactic regarding someone who prostituted themselves almost 30 years ago, and at worst, it's, once again, possibly complete libel. The fourth and final instance I could find of a drag queen being a sex offender. This instance is indeed confirmed. In June of this year, Bryce Williams, stage name Anastasia Diamond, was arrested on child pornography charges. Williams is a drag queen based in Pennsylvania. After a two-year investigation, first started by a tip from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Williams was arrested. He was an LGBTQ activist and HIV medical case manager. Despite some reports to the contrary, Williams is facing 25 counts of felony Class II child pornography and 18 counts of unlawful use of a telecommunication facility. He has not been hit with any child abuse charges. So, all in all, after hours and hours of researching Maddie's claim that convicted pedophiles are reading books to children at libraries, I could only find three instances of this, and one instance of a drag queen being arrested on child pornography charges. Two of the three library incidents are likely completely fabricated, as I cannot find any good evidence of their claims, and they are not corroborated by any trustworthy media source even three years after the fact. And the final incident was due to a failure of the Houston Public Library to follow its own policy of mandatory background checks on all performers. In none of the four cases was any child mistreated, abused, or left alone with a performer. In none of the four cases did any sexual abuse occur unless Bryce Williams is found to have created some of the material he was arrested for possessing. Once again, it seems this claim is busted. Two drag queens in four years, being child sex offenders, when hundreds of them are having children's storytime events around the country, is hardly logical or fair to generalize from. But we already know that Maddie doesn't understand statistics. Claim 17. 
drag queens are flaunting their bodies in front of this child and the picture is too risque to be shown. Drag queen story hour. Let's talk about this. I can't even show this full picture that you see over here because it's a bunch of men dressed up like women, cross-dressers, right? Flaunting their bodies in front of this little baby girl. Uh-oh. Looks like I was able to find the full, uncropped picture. Not only does it not feature drag queens flaunting their bodies in front of this little baby girl, it actually features three completely clothed drag queens in ball gowns. It was also tame enough to be featured on the website of St. Louis Public Radio, which described the event where the picture was taken. It was a drag queen story hour at the St. Louis Public Library, the second such to take place there. And the library was happy to have the event happen again after the first one's great positive reception, given it aligns with the library's goal of welcoming everyone, no matter who they are or how they present, according to the library's youth services specialist. Furthermore, the drag queens saw themselves as educators, exposing their audience to expressions of gender that may be new to them. As one performer said, quote, I had one kid come up and ask if I was a boy or a girl. I just let her know that I'm a boy, but I'm like a life-sized Barbie, just dressing up, end quote. So, once again, Maddie is proven to be an ignorant moron. This time, she's been shown to be a dishonest liar as well, for editing the photo and presenting it as something it's not. So, as far as this claim goes... Claim 18. Gender-affirming care is mutilation and does not improve well-being. Trans is beautiful, they say. No, trans is ugly, folks. Mutilating your body? By supposed, some supposed doctor which shouldn't be making you better and not worse by cutting off your organs? Yeah, that's not beautiful. That's not virtuous. That's not loving. That's, that's terrible. I feel bad for you. If you do that. I've already made a multi-part series all about trans individuals, including the science behind transitioning how trans people have existed throughout history and are not a new phenomenon, and explaining in detail the terms sex, gender, and sexual orientation. One of the videos goes over quality of life outcomes for trans individuals who receive gender-affirming care, which Maddie calls mutilation, because she has absolutely no idea what she's talking about. I'll let an excerpt of that video speak for itself. After 12 months, hormone replacement therapy significantly cuts the occurrence of anxiety by 33% and depression by 19% in trans individuals. HRT lowers depression, anxiety, and stress in female-to-male trans individuals while increasing quality of life. In male-to-female individuals, it also increases quality of sex life. SRS has been shown in multiple studies to improve the lives of trans individuals who desire it. In one extensive survey of 81 trans women and 51 trans men, surgical interventions had an extraordinarily high satisfaction rate and improved quality of life. With the exception of one individual, feminizing surgery satisfaction rate was 96 to 100% and masculinizing surgery satisfaction rate was 94 to 100%. None of the respondents expressed the wish to detransition, despite a few having some disappointment about surgical outcomes. Regret about transitioning is very low. A study of 295 trans people found regret rates of 1 to 1.5%, and the author attributes this regret to poor diagnosis and surgical outcomes, and failure to abide by the 12 months of living experience recommended in the WPATH standards of care prior to surgery. A study of 218 trans individuals who had SRS from 1972 to 1992 found the rate of regret to be slightly higher, at 3.8%. Its conclusion was that sex reassignment outcomes have improved in the past few decades, and that the best indicators of regretting SRS were lack of familial and social support. Yet another study of 163 trans women was done in 2007. It found that 75% of respondents had a better sex life, 78% were satisfied by their genitals' new appearance, 
and almost none had regrets regarding SRS. In addition, a 2014 study of 119 trans women who had undergone SRS found that 82.4% of them could achieve orgasm, with 20.9% of them achieving orgasm, quote, easily, end quote. Clearly, the idea that trans people must sacrifice their sexuality in order to transition is not true. Finally, trans individuals who are not viewed by others as transgender and those who do not disclose to others that they are transgender, reported lower prevalence of suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts. For instance, 6.3% of those who reported that others can never tell they are transgender attempted suicide in the past year, compared to 12.2% of those who reported that others can always tell they are transgender. These statistics were reported in 2019. It seems that trans individuals who can either remove their gender incongruence or minimize its effects, while also not being harassed and abused by society, tend to be happier. Who could have suspected that? Claim 19. Trans people think they are something that they aren't. By some some supposed doctor which should be making you better and not worse by cutting off your organs? Yeah, that's not beautiful. That's not virtuous. That's not loving. That's, that's terrible. I feel bad for you if you do that. Thinking that you're something that you aren't. The only person who knows the contents of someone's thoughts is the person themselves. There are things that are self-evident and or demonstrable. For example, that human beings are not walruses or that there's a strong correlation between being a severely homophobic man and liking dick. That being said, if someone says that they feel like a girl, but to you they look like a boy, how do you know if they're lying or wrong? How could Maddie possibly know the content of these individuals' thoughts? She would probably say that it's impossible for a boy to feel like a girl, or vice versa. But Maddie doesn't even seem to understand the difference between sex and gender, or that sex is complicated. But the fact is that brain structure is complex. People are complex, and our gender identities seem to result from a myriad of factors, including physical ones. The Endocrine Society is a worldwide organization of 18,000 endocrinologists and similar professionals, and has been a pioneer in hormonal science and public health since it was founded in 1916. In 2021, they released an extensive scientific statement, which pointed out that, quote, Studies in people with gender dysphoria found that the phenotypes of specific brain structures, such as the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, of transgender women and transgender men, differ from cisgender men and women, with partial but incomplete sex reversal of sexually dimorphic structures. Genetics may play a role in gender identity. Monozygotic twins have 39% concordance for gender dysphoria. Attempts to identify specific genes governing gender identity have been plagued by small numbers of subjects and low statistical significance. No specific gene has been reproducibly identified. However, such studies have suggested associations with genes encoding steroidogenic enzymes and sex steroid receptors, and it is generally agreed that androgens play an important but not determinative role. The biological underpinnings of sexual orientation and gender identity are apparently related, but are not the same. Thus, there is ample but incomplete evidence for biological substrates, neuroanatomic, 
genetic, and hormonal for gender orientation, making this an important area of ongoing research. End quote. I speak more in depth about possible causes of transsexuality in part three of my series, which again is linked below. The short version is that we don't know for sure exactly what causes someone to be trans, but we do know that it is a real phenomenon. People that feel this way are not crazy or pretending, and evidence suggests that at least part of the cause of being trans is physical, whether that be due to genetics, hormones, or brain structure. Maddie also says this includes thinking they've changed their name. This one particularly pisses me off because my brother recently told me the same thing, i.e. that I think I've changed my name. No, motherfucker. A court judge, the Social Security Administration, my state's government, and the federal government of the United States all disagree with you. So you and your imaginary friend can stuff it, because at this point, you're delusional. You have a belief that is held on to, despite all evidence to the contrary. I want to specify that I am not a medical professional of any type, and I cannot diagnose any illness. But from my layperson's perspective, if someone is like my brother and truly believes that I think I have changed my name, but have not, and they know better because their god told them so, then they are dangerously close to meeting the DSM-5's criteria for grandiose delusional disorder. Claim 20. There is a strict biological binary. If there's so many different genders, why is it that you can only buy shirts today in a male or female size? Because there is only male or female. There's only male chromosomes, female chromosomes, okay? You can't just cut off one organ and say, well, I'm a female now, or I'm a male now. That's not how it works. There's female chromosomes, male chromosomes. You'd have to get a chromosome change, right? You would die. There are female bones and male bones. You'd have to literally get your bones changed if you want to be the separate gender. You would die. There are female muscles, there are male muscles. I could go on and on and on and on and on. His name is Cirrus. Cirrus the skeptic. Well, Cirrus, were you skeptical about transitioning into mutilation? Because that's what it is. You're still a man. You have the chromosomes of a man, the bones of a man, and the muscle structure of a man. I'm going to bring up my educational series one final time here, primarily because it completely debunks the vapid nonsense that Maddie is spewing, but also because it's based on a 27,000-word research paper I wrote that took about four months to complete, and it took about eight months to film and edit the videos. I'd like people to see it and learn from it, and I really hate the tired and beaten chromosome argument. Part one of that series goes over sex, gender, and sexual orientation. In it, I explain why none of those attributes is immutable. In other words, sex, gender, and sexual orientation can all change. I also go over interesting examples of biology, like people born with what seem to be the wrong chromosomes, and intersex people, who are not to be confused with trans people. So, check it out if you're interested in learning about how complicated sex is. Claim 21. Only atheist YouTubers are crazy enough to believe there are more than two genders. But only the scientifically illiterate, only the atheist YouTubers of the world today, only the people that believe in magic, that the world created itself from nothing, would be crazy enough to believe that there's more than two genders. The Bible says that God created them in the beginning, male and female. Male and female created he them. I don't know how there being more than two genders follows Maddie's rant about trans people and scientific illiteracy, but Maddie is, again, wrong here, because she's one lone dumbass with an ignorant opinion, lost in a sea of medical and scientific professionals who disagree with her. Obvious. The aforementioned Endocrine Society states that Quote, gender includes perception of the individual as male, female, or other, both by the individual and by society, end quote. On top of that, the overwhelming majority of academic, medical, and scientific bodies support the fact that trans people and their gender struggles are real. These include, but are not limited to, the American Psychological Association, the World Health Organization, the Association of American Law Schools, the University of California, the United States Federal Government, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, the World Medical Association, the World Psychiatric Association, the United Nations Human Rights Council, and countless other medical professionals. 
So, as far as Maddie's ignorant vitriol about trans people goes, You are made of stupid. Claim 22. AIDS and sexual diseases are brought upon gay people by powerless God. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. You know what they received in themselves? AIDS. You know what they received in themselves? Sexual diseases. I've already talked about this. Gay people aren't the only ones to get AIDS and sexual diseases. And I won't even get into the whole she hasn't proven her God exists thing. Maddie is just hate-mongering again. Claim 23. God makes people go crazy if they reject him. But I want to show you proof, right now, that this group of people that hates God, God gives them over to a reprobate mind and makes them go crazy. You know how the Bible says God gave them over to a strong delusion? God literally made them go crazy. Delusional. Wacko. Let me give you an example. These are specific atheist YouTubers that have attacked me after I preached the Bible. And I present the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to these atheist YouTubers. And I tell them how to be saved. And what they do is they reject it, reject it, reject it, reject it, and then God finally makes them go crazy. Check this out. This guy's name is Peter when he attacked me a few years back. Now he thinks he's a woman. And he thinks that his name is Ethel. You can see how people lose their minds. This man, David, attacked me as I was preaching the Bible over a year ago. And now, he just came out a few weeks ago as, oh, well, I'm a woman now. Dresses up like a little girl in some of his videos. Says, my name is Bree. No, you're a man, David. You're a man. And you know what? This is proof that when you reject God, and let this be a lesson. Let this right here that you're seeing with your own eyes be a lesson to those of you who reject and hate our Lord Jesus Christ. Who reject God, who are listening to this message and saying, you know what, I hate God as a result. Well, you know what? God, the Bible says he will not always strive with man. I wish that he would, but he's perfect. His laws are just. He's not always going to strive with us. There comes a point where God gives up. He gives them over to a reprobate mind to do these things. These people have gone bonkers. This picture right here. Same YouTuber. Puts out videos against Dr. Hoban. Puts out videos against other pastors. Says that what they're saying is wrong. You know what? God said, fine, I'll make you go crazy. It's proof right there. An example. I'm just going to kind of sift through these, right? Let this be an example of what happens when you reject God, when you hear the word of God. You can see with your own eyes, even my own wife who's back there right now, literally said about this guy, she says, you know what? He doesn't even look like the same person. This is so disgusting. It grossed her out. Bree, it grossed her out. Because it grosses any normal person out. But when you lose your mind, usually it's a result of God literally punishing you and giving you over to these vile affections. This is both an absurd and disgusting claim. People don't go crazy and become trans because they reject your cruel, sadistic, rapist, egotistical, homophobic, misogynistic, murderous, barbaric, cannibalistic, bloodthirsty, infinitely evil god, Maddie. Not only can you not prove that, but I've already shown that, unlike your god, gender incongruence and gender dysphoria, and thus trans people, are very real. So you can take your reprobate threats and shove them. Claim 24. It is hateful for homosexual couples to adopt children. And you know how hateful it is to adopt children as a homosexual couple when they can't have a normal mom and dad? They have to have dad and dad. You know how stupid that sounds? They have to have mom and mom. They can never know what it's like to truly have a mom and a dad, okay? The only reason they adopt children is probably to molest them, according to statistics. No! Maddie's claim here seems to be that homosexual parents have a negative impact on their children. This is not the case, and is shown in scientific literature. There are gaps in the literature with regard to some areas of development for the children of homosexual male couples, but this quote is quite clear. Quote, it is significant that, even taking into account all the questions and or limitations that may characterize research in this area, none of the published research suggests conclusions different from that which will be summarized below." End quote. The previous quote comes from a 2005 report from the American Psychological Association. The report points out that, with respect to parenthood, there have historically been three concerns regarding gay individuals. 1. The supposed mental illness inherent to gay individuals. 2. That lesbian women don't make good mothers, i.e. they are less maternal. 
Three, that homosexual parents can't meet the time obligations required to raise a child due to their sexual relationships. The report goes on to debunk all of these unfounded concerns and others. Children raised by lesbian mothers develop their gender identity and role within normal expected ranges. This has been confirmed by literally a dozen studies. There is nothing to suggest that being raised by lesbian mothers impacts their development in these areas in any significant way. In addition, it seems that, contrary to the stereotype that lesbians are somewhat masculine, children raised by lesbian mothers tend to be more feminine. There is, unfortunately, no such rigorous data yet regarding gay men and the development of their children's gender identity and role. With regard to sexual identity, however, there is such data for both gay male parents and lesbian parents. Many studies have been done, and while many have had small sample sizes, none have found a significantly elevated rate of homosexuality among children raised by gay parents. The report concludes that, quote, Overall, the belief that children of lesbian and gay parents suffer deficits in personal development has no empirical foundation, end quote. The report then offers these summaries. Quote, Results of research to date suggest that children of lesbian and gay parents have positive relationships with peers, and that their relationships with adults of both sexes are also satisfactory. The picture of lesbian mothers' children that emerges is one of general engagement in social life with peers, with fathers, with grandparents, and with mothers' adult friends, both male and female, both heterosexual and homosexual. Fears about children of lesbians and gay men being sexually abused by adults, ostracized by peers, or isolated in single-sex, lesbian, or gay communities have received no support from the results of existing research." Quote, in summary, there is no evidence to suggest that lesbian women or gay men are unfit to be parents, or that psychosocial development among children of lesbian women or gay men is compromised relative to that among offspring of heterosexual parents. Not a single study has found children of lesbian or gay parents to be disadvantaged in any significant respect relative to children of heterosexual parents, end quote. I'd also like to note that the report also mentions Paul Cameron, Maddie's earlier dishonest source, by name. Quote, Some non-scientific organizations have attempted to convince courts that there is an actual scientific dispute in this area by citing research performed by Paul Cameron as supporting the existence of deficits in gay and lesbian parents or their children compared to heterosexual parents or their children. In fact, there is no scientific evidence of such deficits. Cameron's research is methodologically suspect. His key findings in this area have not been replicated and are contradicted by the reputable published research. Unlike research that makes a contribution to science, his key findings and conclusions have rarely been cited by subsequent scientific studies published in peer-reviewed journals as informing their scientific inquiry. For a detailed critique of the research project on which Cameron has based many of his published papers, see Herrick, 1998, end quote. Yet more evidence that Cameron is a fraud, but we already knew that. As far as Maddie's comment that, quote, they have to have dad and dad. Do you know how stupid that sounds? End quote. No, I don't know how stupid it sounds. It just sounds like a family to me. Maybe that's because I'm not violently hemorrhaging idiocy out of my ears, though. I imagine that would taint anything I hear and make it sound stupid. Claim 25. NAMBLA and the LGBTQ community are intricately connected. You heard what I said of NAMBLA, right? NAMBLA is supposedly the man-boy love association. They went when the LGBT began the organization. Of course, sodomites have always existed, but the organization, the LGBT, when they first began, NAMBLA would march with them. You know, NAMBLA marches with me or walks with me, they'd say. It's right there in our faces that they're after the children. Harry Hay consistently advocated the inclusion of NAMBLA in the gay pride parades. I dug up the article Maddie uses as a source here, which is, of course, cherry-picked, as well as other info on NAMBLA. NAMBLA stands for the 
North American Man-Boy Love Association, a pedophilia advocacy group widely reviled by the LGBTQ community. It has also been investigated by law enforcement multiple times, with arrests made in sting operations. Undercover operatives reported that, as of the mid-1990s, NAMBLA numbered only around 1,100 members. The LGBTQ community has been accused of being inconsistent regarding its stance on pedophilia. This is not actually the case. Voices few and far between in the community have advocated for inappropriate or criminal relationships between adults and children, such as prominent gay rights pioneer Harry Hay, whom Maddie cites. But even he was criticized by his peers, as pointed out in the very article that Maddie cherry-picks. Quote, In his own determined, often irritating manner, Harry Hay resisted becoming a model homosexual hero. Nowhere was this more evident than in Hay's persistent support of Nambla's right to march in gay pride parades. In 1994, he refused to march with the official parade commemorating the Stonewall riots in New York because it refused Nambla a place in the event. Instead, he joined a competing march, dubbed the Spirit of Stonewall, which included Nambla as well as many of the original Gay Liberation Front members. Even many of Hay's more dedicated supporters could not side with him on this, but from Hay's point of view, silencing any part of the movement because it was disliked or hated by mainstream culture was both a moral failing and a seriously mistaken political strategy." End quote. The Stonewall Riots were riots that essentially set off the gay rights movement in 1969. David Thorstad, one of the founding members of NAMBLA, has complained in writing that the so-called Stonewall generation believed in almost complete sexual liberation, including liberation from age restrictions to at least some extent, but the gay movement since then now seeks to, quote, sanitize the image of homosexuality, end quote. He goes on to complain, Quote, As the beginning statement of this article demonstrates, man-boy love occasionally intersected the broader gay movement in the years following the Stonewall riots, even though it was not a major issue. End quote. Quote, Instead of fighting to liberate youth, it became fashionable to argue that youth needed protection, especially from sex with men. A perversion of language arose, reminiscent of the new speak of George Orwell's 1984, in which love really meant rape. The negative experiences of many females at the hands of straight men aroused skepticism about the ability of boy lovers to be any different with their boyfriends. Under pressure from the women's movement and lesbian activists, the gay movement began to internalize straight society's stereotype of pederasty as inherently exploitative, a form of sexual abuse, even when the youth wanted and enjoyed it. Like society at large, the women's and lesbian-slash-gay movements seemed more concerned about consensual sex between men and boys than about actual physical abuse of children within the family, an epidemic problem. Most activists in these movements, both adult-run, wished the issue of cross-generational sex would just go away, but it didn't." End quote. Thorstad's entire outlook is a problem here. He firmly believes that young boys are capable of consenting to sexual relationships with adult men, and lambasts lesbians for fighting especially strongly against such insinuations. As I've already shown, the vast majority of pedophiles are men, with female pedophiles being almost non-existent, which is likely part of the reason for this opposition. In addition, while the percentage of pedophiles in the population is unknown, the upper limit has been suggested to be around 5%. And after that, gay males are an even smaller subset of the pedophile minority. A large part of the opposition to pedophilia slash pederasty, that is, sexual relationships between adult men and adolescent or young boys, is the verified mental damage that such sex abuse can cause. This includes sex abuse being a major risk for depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Basically, child sex abuse and pedophilia are not okay. That is why pedophilia is in the DSM-5 as a disorder. Furthermore, I have pointed out previously that the LGBTQ community has already repeatedly denounced such fringe groups as NAMBLA and pedophilia in general. 
GLAAD, the Human Rights Campaign, and the LGBT Foundation have all explicitly condemned pedophilia and child sexual abuse of any kind as recently as 2020. These are three very large voices in the LGBTQ community, all separately condemning child sex crimes. And as much as Maddie likes to pretend that the community is some strange cabal that acts as one mind, via comments like this, We have to stand against it. We have to stand in opposition of the LGBT. But the organization, the LGBT, when they first began... The LGBTQ community is, in fact, a very diverse group of people in different organizations. No one person speaks for the whole group. One pioneer like Harry Hay, however famous he may be, does not speak for everyone when he advocates for child sex abuse. And despite this, every single organization reached out to denounces what he advocated for. And as one last thing, I'd like to point out that Maddie is wrong here. The Stonewall Riots were in 1969, and NAMBLA wasn't started until 1978. There were advocates for pedophilia right after Stonewall and before NAMBLA, and I'm sure some of them had their supporters in the gay rights movement and marched with gay rights advocates. But to insinuate that they were welcomed with open arms goes against what one of the very founders of NAMBLA says, and ignores what he complains about. Claim 26. The they are encouraging sympathy for pedophiles and homosexuals. TED Talk promotes pedophile sympathy. This is where we're at now. They're trying to get people to sympathize with homosexuals, sympathize with pedophiles, say that they're victims. Disney and Nickelodeon. I want to talk for a moment about Black Lives Matter. So Maddie literally just says Disney and Nickelodeon and moves on while showing a Christian Broadcasting Network article headline about Pride ads being aired. She also says that Ritz Crackers supports LGBTQ people. The horror! Even Ritz Crackers is coming out for the LGBT. I noticed that, while pausing the screenshot, even the article itself points out that, quote, During June, the Disney Channel itself aired a Pride ad featuring Raven Simone, who is a lesbian. Raven Simone never says the word gay in the ad, focusing instead on coming, quote, together with all walks of life, end quote. I don't see anything wrong with this stuff, given the information Maddie is providing. LGBTQ people aren't inherently nasty or unhealthy for children to know about, and revealing their existence is not some taboo to be avoided. Yeah, it can be done in a gross way if you talk exclusively and explicitly about sexual material, the same can be said about heterosexual people and their identities, and that doesn't seem to be the case here. So if Maddie can't even be bothered to read the article, I'm not going to look the damn thing up. Finally, as for the goddamn pedophile accusation again, note that she is providing a video titled TED Talks Promotes Pedophile Sympathy from some dude named Andrew Says. That doesn't seem to be the speaker in the thumbnail. <sighs> Time for me to do more digging. A few moments later. It didn't take long to find the actual talk by Miriam Hine. She explains many of the things I've already gone over, such as the fact that not all pedophiles are child molesters, that most child sex abuse is committed by non-pedophiles, and that child sex abuse is never okay. In the ICD-10, the International Classification System for Illnesses, pedophilia is coded as the sexual preference for pre-adolescent children. It is listed under the sexual disorders. Whether the persistent occurrence of sexual thoughts and feelings for pre-adolescent children have been acted upon or not is not relevant to the diagnosis. The vast majority of all pedophiles are men, about 99%. It is crucial to understand the difference between pedophilia and child sexual abuse, which is illegal and must always be. Pedophilia is only the sexual preference for pre-adolescent children. Scientific studies indicate that only 20 to 30% of all child molesters are pedophiles. 
The vast majority of perpetrators are not pedophiles, but they're sexually interested in adults. Children can easily become victims of child sexual abuse because of their loyalty and because of ease of access. Not every pedophile abuses children. And not everyone who abuses children is a pedophile. Differentiating between these two groups is essential. Let me be very clear here. Abusing children is wrong without any doubt. But a pedophile who doesn't abuse children has done nothing wrong. She also hammers home the point that we aren't responsible for our thoughts, but for our actions. My perspective has been completely changed by hearing Jonas's story, hearing about his cruel fate, and understanding the difference between child sexual abuse and pedophilia. As a medical student with a background in psychology, I feel it as my responsibility to help others overcome and escape wrong stigmatization and to have a positive impact on our future society. By changing our view about pedophilia as a society and by offering them support and therapy, we can help millions of people to live better lives and we can effectively reduce child sexual abuse. No one is responsible for their feelings but everyone is responsible for their actions. I find it interesting that, even in the atheist community, we tend to accept this only so far. Thought crime is immoral, and it's inherent in the Bible's heinous morality, we say. But then pedophiles come up. You're attracted to children? Disgusting! You're a degenerate! An attraction is not an action. You cannot punish people for their thoughts. You can change your own actions, certainly. I would not leave my children alone around a pedophile, just as I wouldn't leave myself around someone who frequently speaks of fantasizing about torturing their friends to death. But at the end of the day, we should have sympathy for pedophiles, because as Miriam points out, if you give enough of a damn to listen, pedophiles have a mental disorder and it needs to be addressed. They have it through no fault of their own and it can ruin their life. Scientific studies indicate that one of the strongest predictors for child sexual abuse committed by pedophiles is social isolation. People who can't tell anyone that they're pedophiles logically won't get any help. We shouldn't increase the suffering of pedophiles by excluding them, by blaming and mocking them. By doing that, we increase their isolation and we increase the chance of child sexual abuse. We can help them accept their sexuality and help them learn to refrain from acting on their sexual urges which cause harm to children. We can encourage them never to commit child sexual abuse. Pedophiles who have received treatment have a better understanding of who they can turn to in order to prevent abuse before it happens. Child sex abuse is not and should not ever be okay under any circumstances, but pedophiles who have done no crime should not be ostracized from society. They should be helped through treatment. Unfortunately, the viewers of Miriam's talk seem not to agree. Many are the downvotes, and many are the deranged, small-minded comments. Some compare pedophilia to being a serial killer, some say pedophilia should never be accepted, missing the point entirely. Some accuse anyone who applauds the speech of being a danger to children. And someone with over 300 upvotes and a sticker from the video uploader is enraged that no one threw a shoe at her while she was speaking. Despite us having landed on the moon over half a century ago and being connected across the world with the internet, it appears we are, by and large, still incapable of thinking with any degree of criticality. Monkeys, it seems, are gonna monkey. Fantasyland does not need to be considered a reality for those of us who are real people, okay? Who actually deal with facts. 
And you know what? You atheist YouTubers that go out and support these other YouTubers that have gone crazy and lost their minds, you have no business chiming in on an adult conversation. Adults can figure out what gender they are. If you're saying, well, I'm confused about my gender, that just shows that you are not an adult. You're not a normal person. And I'm not transphobic. Transphobic means that you're afraid of them. I ain't afraid of the trans people, okay? This is the crux of Maddie's entire video. She wants you to believe that trans people, any LGBTQ people really, are God-hating, perverted child molesters. That they are crazy. That trans people don't know who they are. That they are not adults, and are confused about their gender. That atheists hate God, are insane, and can't make coherent arguments. She edits other people's statements and videos to do this. She uses biased, extreme right-wing hate groups as her sources. She gets, knowingly or not, fake news stories and completely discredited former scientists to bolster her poor points. And all the while, she spews the same unfounded slander and lies about the people she hates. Lies that I've just spent a tremendous amount of time debunking. But despite all of this, Despite all of her misinformation, desperate lying, poor research, and extreme hate, Maddie has the gall to claim that she has the truth, and that she deals in facts and logic. I hope this desecration of her vile arguments has been enough to show otherwise. The truth is that Maddie Powlett, aka Matt Powell, is a vapid, hate-mongering drone who lives in an Alabamian compound owned by a convicted wife-beater. She claims that people who disagree with her live in fantasy land. Meanwhile, she believes in an invisible monster who will punish her if she thinks things it doesn't like. She clings to her archaic, irrational beliefs like a baby left alone in the dark with nothing but its blinky. Because that's what Maddie is. She's an intellectual baby. She lacks critical thinking skills, and has proved repeatedly that she is not honest or willing to correct her mistakes. She lives in fear. Fear of change, fear of LGBTQ people, and fear of anything her precious book tells her to be afraid of. Because little Maddie can't think for herself. In her sermon, she makes a statement to atheist YouTubers. But I want to just make a statement to every single atheist YouTuber online. All of you who have gone out of your way to make cartoon videos to target the minds of children, these facts and these statistics prove you and prove your ideologies wrong. They prove them false. And not only do they prove them false, they prove that when you're corrected, you will not change. That's the difference between me and these atheists. If I'm incorrect, I'm compelled by reason to change my position. Because the Bible says that I should pursue truth. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are true, think on these things. So I'm supposed to pursue truth. Maddie claims she will change her mind in the face of facts, but her behavior has proven that this is a lie, and that she is, therefore, a liar. I ain't afraid of the trans people, okay? I just hurt for the children that are being confused and bombarded with this gender confusion in the world today. It's confusing the youth of America. It's, it's, it's very scary. It's not gender confusion that is a danger to the world and children, Maddie. It's you and people like you. This is what is a danger to children. I believe that all of these drag queens, right, should be lined up, every single one of them, that has flaunted their body in a sexual manner in front of children, I believe that they should all be lined up, and by the power of the United States Constitution and the authority of God's word should be dealt with via firing squad. You say, oh, that's so hateful. No, it's loving, because I love children, and I love this country, and love is what drives me to put out the pedophiles, to put out the perverts, 
okay? And you come here, you constantly leech off me, then you go complain to other people, oh, Matt won't, Matt's taking advantage of me. Dude, you <laughs> will go to hell! I am not joking! Look at me! Matt, stop. Look at me! Stop. You look at me right now! Stop! That came here has nothing video. to do with this. I came here. We are going to talk I'm about this. You're smile. You are insane. You think I am yelling too hard? You have lost Stop. your mind. Stop. You're going to talk to me. No. You're going to talk to me right now. I'm getting out. You're of here. acting like a woman. Why don't you no, talk to me I'm like a man? Acting like a woman. I came yeah, here for the stupid. You're video. acting like a woman, dude. You don't believe that gay people could, should be stoned to death, do you? I believe the Bible puts a death penalty on it. Obviously, not by me or by anybody, you know, in 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 our regular society. Obviously, I believe it's the government's job to to execute criminals. And you know, I believe that the Bible says clearly that homosexuality is a it's a criminal crime. It's a it's a it's a crime. It's one of the worst crimes ever. I, I mean, it's good that we're not a theocracy, theocracy, right? Because we're not a theocracy in this country. So you don't believe yeah, our government well, should be able to dictate uh, that we stone gay? Are you is that what you're advocating for? Is that our government should stone gays to death I, I, them? I, I don't by whatever means they execute people and obviously I believe in humane you know putting to death I think that's a but, contradiction you know, what you're saying humane you can't use the word humane and then say you're gonna kill people who are gay right but the thing is I mean whatever the whatever our government says as far as like for a death penalty I think should go for them why you know, that's, that's wait, what, wait so no but you're saying you agree that that the government should create laws that um, in order to execute gay people. That's what you're telling me? Absolutely. Dear Lord, I pray that America would wake up to the perversion that is going on and that parents would not send their kids to drag queen story hour to be around a bunch of pedophiles. Lord, I pray you'd strike those pedophiles dead, every single one of these drag queens dead, Lord. I pray that you would wipe them out and that you would eradicate them through your power. And Lord, we know that you will someday if not now. That's what you believe in. That's you. You are the problem, Maddie. Not drag queens, not homosexuals, not children who are gay, not trans people. You and your hatred are the problem. Perhaps one day you will grow up and think for yourself. Maybe then you will change your beliefs and become a better person. But I doubt that will happen. That's why, having completely masticated your pathetic attempt at a strong argument, I will now return to ignoring you. Because you are not worth engaging with further.